Hello, Army of Light, Earth Division, Boots on the Ground, Shauna L. Francis. Today is February 8th, 2023. I hope you are all doing really well. I know that it's been really tough the last couple of days with these channelings with Queen Elizabeth. Um, today is no different, just tough in other ways. Um, she gets very personal about an experience that she had. Um, it's graphic, it's intense, it's disturbing. So here's your warning right now, guys. Um, and as we get to that place, I will let you know and you can choose whether or not you want to continue watching or not. Yeah, the last couple of days have been pretty, pretty tough. Um, the team has warned us, warned me that this would be really hard and it is. <clears throat> um, today, I spent three over three hours with Queen Elizabeth trying to get through about 1900 words. It took a long time. It took so much focus and patience trying to not let my mind wander, be focused, ready to hear what she has to say next. We're talking about one sentence coming in and then five to 10 minutes pause another sentence coming in and another big pause and trying to maintain my focus with her with this. She was really having a hard time talking about this experience um, that she had. All right, well, like I said, thanks guys for being here. Thanks again for, for joining, even though this is getting really tough. This is important what we're doing um, as light workers, always with love, always with that intention of love understanding, compassion. <clears throat> We're helping to expand our consciousness here with this information. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get into this here. Uh, she came right in and said, good evening, Shauna, how are you doing today, may I ask? And I said, well, I said, it's been a tough day to be honest. Um, I said, uh, but overall, I'm doing well. I, I'm resolved to this pro process. I understand that these are going to be bumps and bruises. <clears throat> I said, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm still very excited about the mission and I'm really excited about bringing this information to the light, to our consciousness, so we can finally stop what this is. We can um, help eradicate this, transmute this energy. And I said, I think that we're making a great partnership and I'm, I'm happy that we are doing this. And she, I said, how are you doing, Elizabeth? And she said, well, I'd like to say that I'm doing just as well as you, but that would not be the truth. I am still struggling quite a bit, trying to string together just the right words to convey my thoughts, to convey my truth, to really be present and in my authenticity as an infinite being of light. How to be of service in my heart space to help reconcile what I've done in the past, what we've done in the past, what the negative reptilians are still doing today. I am struggling, she said. <coughs> Excuse me, I said, yes, well, I, I hear you and I'm sorry. I said, what we're doing is really big and it's important. Um, and what we're doing is exciting. We are being of service to this planet. I said, we're trying to ascend and this truth will set us free. So I, get, I gave her a little bit of a pep talk. I said, I would love nothing more than to see these perpetrators be brought to justice here and to stop these practices. Uh, so we have to start somewhere, um, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, we're making progress. And she said, thank you for that, Shauna. Shall we get started? And I said, yes, please, let's do this, Elizabeth, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> she said, um, thank you, Shauna. More information from back earlier in my reign as queen. All right. <clears throat> she said here, it was a spring, a spring day, a fairly quiet afternoon for which I was thankful. Once again, the sun was shining, a little bit of crispness in the air, a slight breeze, it smelled so fresh. I love the smell of springtime, she said, when all these, the trees get their leaves, all the dormant trees and shrubs and greenery fill in, uh, seemingly coming back to life. 
I was in my late 20s and I remember that I was sitting in one of the drawing rooms at Balmoral Castle in Scotland watching the children play outside and I would ponder what would life have been like without these two beautiful children, children whom I love so very much. She said here, I, I love these children so much that I thought that my heart would burst with pride and joy. Charles and Anne. Yes, they were my pride and joy, she said. What would life have been like without these two beautiful children? Looking back now, I could see that it would have been a very gray, sterile, and dark existence for me. These beautiful children sparked something very deep within me their innocence, their charm, their hugs and kisses, their long drawn out stories, jabbering on and on. My children, she said, were, were the spark, were the bright spark that helped me cling to the more beautiful parts of humanity, parts that would continue to fade away more and more with each passing year. In those early years, she said, I was really giving so much of myself to my royal role and as queen. I was trying to do it all with a smile on my face. There was the optimism in the air. The world was feeling so alive and fresh. There was so much travel and dinners and meetings, but it was always the children who made my heart sing the most. And then I really felt my energy do another deep dive. And whenever this happens, I think, okay, something big's coming here. And, you know, a, a long, long pause. <clears throat> and she said, Shauna, I am heartbroken for what I am about to tell you. And I said, I can feel this. I said, just one word at a time. And she said, <clears throat> excuse me, I did it. And I said, what did you do, Elizabeth? She said here, and team, this is where it's going to get um, more disturbing stuff here. Not about children, but about, about the queen. <clears throat> when I was 28, I received a letter. Inside this letter were two locks of hair each belonging to my two children, Charles and Anne. The accompanying note read, Dear Queen Elizabeth, I am sorry to inform you that your children are in grave danger. You must pack up and come back to Buckingham Palace at your earliest convenience. From there you will await instructions. Well, she said, this letter did not come through the regular post. It seemed to be hand addressed with each of the locks of hair labeled with my children's names. I questioned the authenticity of the letter and the locks of hair included within, but something didn't feel right. So I did exactly what the letter said. We packed up everything and by the next morning we were returning back to London. Upon arrival at Buckingham Palace, two footmen approached me and said that I would be needed in the study at my earliest convenience. My husband took the children along with the various help staff and I made my way to the study. Once inside, I was greeted by two dark and tall men wearing overcoats and hats. It was just the three of us in this room, and I remember, who would even dare to hurt my children? I was not intimidated by these two fellows, but I was deeply curious, and I was concerned. I said, what is this all about? What is the matter? What happened next is a bit of a blur, she said. Big long pause. These two men came and stood at my sides, one on each side of me, at each arm. They pushed me down to sit on a chair. This behavior grabbed my attention. Immediately, 
I sat there as still as a mouse, barely breathing, trying to keep my mind clear. The air in the room felt electric. All the hairs on my body were standing on end, and I was beginning to notice a metallic taste at the back of my throat. Another long pause. One of the goons, she, she actually called these guys goons, one of the goons bent down and put his face in my face, eye to eye, and said, Dear Queen, it seems we have a bit of a problem. Make no mistake, he said, we are fixing this problem today. And with that, he grabbed me by the throat, threw me down on the floor. I didn't even have time to scream, it happened so quickly. The other man grabbed me and laid me on my back, and while he held my throat tightly, he shoved a white ball of cloth into my mouth. He gave me a look that said, if you make any sound, I will kill you. He never said the words, but he didn't have to. Again, guys, warning about the graphic nature of this experience for her. Um, he held me down by the neck while the other man punched me hard in the gut. And team, I was, I was feeling energetically what was going on. I was just, I was, I felt like a part of me was in this room and feeling the energetics going on. It was, it was outrageous. It was awful. She said here, I'm trying not to scream, but I can't help it. I am screaming through this cloth, cloth and I'm starting to kick and fight. The room is a study, so it's fairly soundproof. It was built that way on purpose. The man holding my neck squeezes it tighter. I feel like I'm almost ready to pass out. The other man proceeded to rape me. I was in a sheer panic, but somehow I could barely move. I could barely breathe. I could barely move as if a paralysis had set in. I was absolutely terrified and mortified. Before he was done, my whole body had then gone limp as if it were lifeless. I felt like I was in some kind of coma where a part of me could observe what's happening, but my body was just completely unresponsive. It was the most awful feeling, just helpless. After he was complete, they both drug me back up onto that chair where I sat clumple, crumpled up and lifeless as though all the muscles in my body had stopped working. My eyes were open and I could see and I could think, but my body was completely shut down. The one man who held my neck propped my head up so I could look back into the face of the man who just raped me. My eyes were open and I could see the man quite clearly, even though my body was flaccid. He put a finger in my face and I watched as that finger grew green and scaly with a sharp claw. And I remember the smell being terrible. That smell, putrid, she said. And he said to me, dear queen, it would be wise for you and your children if you would simply stop fighting who and what you are. And with that same scaly finger in my face, he said, is that clear? And I had just started to feel my body come back to me, barely enough for me to nod my head, yes, one time, while looking at him straight in the eyes. I did it, she said. At that point, if I had any aspirations or thoughts about making my life my own, forging my own path forward, it all left in that moment. 
Even though I wasn't exactly sure what I had agreed to, I also knew that I had no choice. It would have been very easy for the likes of those men to hurt or kill my children. I never spoke of this to anyone. I laid there half paralyzed in that chair as the two men simply walked out the door. I'm not sure how many moments it was, but slowly the feeling came back to my body. I was able to remove the white cloth from my mouth, stand up, straighten my hair and my clothes. When I felt steady enough on my feet, I left and I found the children who were with Philip. My cheeks were flush and I was shaking. He asked, are you okay? And I said, yes, and I gave him a small smile. He never did ask any more questions. It was as if it never happened. Looking back on it now, she said, I realized that I blocked much of this event out of my memory. The, com the commitment I had made was ever present, but the incident itself felt very dark, fuzzy and murky. And eventually it felt as though it almost never happened at all. Like maybe it was a dream but it made a very strong impression on me and it was a major turning point for how I understood myself. There's a big pause here and I said, I'm so sorry, Elizabeth, that that happened. I'm sorry that you are reliving it again today as you describe it. I said, please continue whenever you're ready. And she said, thank you so much, Shauna, for your patience as I found the strength and resolve to recount this story. I said, you're welcome. I said, I'm so very sorry. She said, Shauna, this feels complete for me today. All right, so <clears throat> that, was, that was all for today. That took three hours. It took three hours to get through that information. Um, I, I don't even really know how to talk about this. I mean, I mean, I, I literally just got, I just got done channeling this uh, an hour and a half ago. So I'm still very much in it, um, trying to process it, trying to, you know, hold the light here and just give her so much love and compassion for this. Um, I think her kids would have been around six and four at that time-ish around there. Um, anyway, just these, these little snippets trying to get a better sense for who and, you know, who she was, how this all happened, how could this have all been happening uh, without anybody knowing, you know. Um, so you could see the kind of leverage that uh, the negative reptilians were holding over her early on in her years when she was still feeling pretty dynamic and <clears throat> feeling as though she could make her own way, but um, it became very obvious very quickly that that wasn't going to be the case. Okay, guys, I'm going to go. Uh, thanks again for being here. Thanks for all your love and support and for trusting in me, trusting in the queen and uh, holding the light through this process. This is, uh, this is why we're here, guys. <laughs> all right. I love all of you so much. Thank you. I will talk to you tomorrow. Mwah.